uh, welcome uh, colleagues. We're just uh, a couple of minutes away from getting started properly. So uh, for those of you who are watching on Facebook Live, uh, for a very warm welcome to this session. Uh, what you might like to do, just to check, we normally do this before we get going properly. I'm assuming that you can hear myself uh, and Chris, uh, we've been chatting just now, but um, if you could type into the comments under the video, just type in a yes, maybe, maybe a yes and say where you're located, uh, nearest town, so that we can um, just get a, a confirmation that you can hear us. Um, so you can put yes for Simon and uh, Chris will uh, say something in a moment. Um, okay, so Val says hi. Patricia saying no thanks. And SCA survivor in Essex. Welcome, Gwen. Mitral regurg regurgitation, okay. Um, so let's see, Sue, Sue is saying yes in Solihull. Excellent. Um, Chris, would you, would you, you can maybe tell people what your day's been like, we could just to get a confirmation that colleagues can hear you. Yeah, sure, no, thanks very much, Simon. Yep, no, my day's been um, very good, thanks very much. I've been in practice this morning and then just catching up with some bits and pieces this afternoon and just getting ready for the webinar this evening. So Fantastic. hopefully you can all hear me okay. Fantastic. Um, again, if I could uh, ask the audience just to confirm, just, uh, okay, Breed is saying yes, can hear clearly. Excellent. Um, so we've got colleagues listening in from St. Lucia, Cornwall, Hampshire, uh, and uh, further afield. So St. Lucia, that's, uh, that sounds like a nice place to... Sounds very exotic. <laughs> <laughs> I'd <I'd> rather be. <laughs> <laughs> welcome St. Lucia. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think we can get going. So just a very warm welcome indeed to, uh, firstly, Chris Arden. Thank you, Chris, for taking time out to present to members of the public uh, on uh, European Heart Valve Disease Awareness Week. And... Um, Welcome audience members if you're attending live and if you're watching the recording, uh, whether it's uh, on the face Silver Surface Facebook page or somewhere else, a very warm welcome to yourself. So this evening uh, is part of the celebration and activities of European Heart Valve Disease Awareness Week 2019. This primary care webinar is uh, aiming to raise awareness, uh, some of the current, current guidelines and understanding about the diagnosis and treatment uh, of heart valve disease. Uh, it's an in heart valve disease is increasing in prevalence and is associated with a negative impact on uh, patients' quality of life and life expectancy. And primary care plays an important role in identifying patients with heart valve disease and when appropriate, referring on for further evaluation and intervention as required. So this presentation is looking at some of the uh, causes of heart valve disease uh, together with some of the uh, typical symptoms and some of the investigations and indications for referral. Um, Chris Arden, our presenter this evening, is a GP. Uh, he's a GP partner at, uh, uh, in Chandler's Ford uh, in Hampshire. It is Hampshire, isn't it? Uh, yes, yeah. Yep. And um, he has experience both in general practice and in community cardiac clinics. Uh, and works, I think you have links also with Southampton, uh, mm -hmm. one of the hospitals or University of Southampton. Yeah. yeah. Right, Chris. And Chris is also a trustee of Heart Valve Voice. Um, Heart Valve Voice is the um, uh, charity that is uh, sponsoring uh, this activity this evening. And uh, before we go any further, I would like to also thank the uh, colleagues who operate and, and look after the Silver Surfers website, whose cooperation has uh, made this possible. Um, I'm going to hand over uh, now to Chris, and obviously we'll be looking at the Facebook page for questions and comments. Uh, we'll have time to uh, look at some of those after Chris's um, uh, not too long presentation. And uh, please do type in the comments, any questions or comments, and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can. The aim of this is to, to help you with your understanding of heart valve disease 
Um, so thank you, uh, Chris, and uh, I'll hand over to you now. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Simon. And thanks very much indeed for inviting me to present tonight on trying to raise the awareness of heart valve disease, both within the sort of public and the professional communities. And again, very grateful to Heart Valve Voice and the Global Heart Hub for um, setting up the presentation this evening. Obviously, there's a lot to do in terms of raising awareness and Heart Valve Voice have been an important part of that over the last sort of six years. We're a sort of collaborative team made first and foremost by patients, cardiologists, surgeons, GPs, and relevant cardiac patient societies. What I'm gonna try and cover tonight is really looking at some of the sort of background to setting the scene in terms of the epidemiology and etiology of valvular heart disease. And I'm gonna spend the majority of the talk really focusing on sort of left-sided um, heart valve disease, primarily mitral and aortic valve disease because this tends to be the most severe and significant in terms of sort of patient symptoms and quality of life. And there's also the one that's most amenable to intervention, whether that be sort of medical therapy or surgical intervention. So the majority of the talk will be focusing on, on mitral and aortic bowel disease. I'm gonna highlight the importance of screening, so identifying patients with suspected valvular disease. So the importance of auscultation from the physician or the nurse's point of view and the importance of listening out for, for murmurs in patients with symptoms that may be suggestive of valvular heart disease. I'm going to obviously cover the sort of symptoms and what those might look like and feel like for those individuals who do have underlying heart problems and then think about appropriate investigations. So how do we image? What's the best way of accessing those investigations? And then most importantly, in many respects, looking at sort of treatment options and intervention options for valvular heart disease. So just some sort of very basic sort of anatomy initially. Obviously, the heart has four heart valves, two on the left side of the heart, which is the aortic valve and the mitral valve, and two on the right side of the heart, the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve. So the blood flows into the right atrium and then into the right ventricle and then out through the right ventricular outflow tract and the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary arteries and thereby into the lungs. It's then oxygenated and comes back into the heart through the pulmonary arteries into the left atrium through the mitral valve and then out through the aortic valve into what we call the systemic circulation. So this is all the oxygenated blood. Obviously those valves, when they open normally and close normally, function absolutely as you would expect in terms of limiting the flow of blood in one direction. We run into trouble, however, when the valves either become thickened and re reduced excursion of the leaflets, and when they, which is called stenosis, or when there's regurgitation, so the leaflets don't meet, they don't what we call collapse, so the actual sides of the leaflets don't meet together and you're left with an orifice in the middle of the valve and you get leaking or regurgitation through the valve. What we listen for when we're listening to the, to the heart, to the chest wall, is generally sort of turbulent. So when a, whenever there's no sort of clean laminar flow of blood through the valves, it becomes more turbulent. So either if the valve is thickened and stenosed, or if there's regurgitation. And this turbulence of the blood flow through the valves causes an increase in the heart sound. And that's what we hear as a murmur. And there's two phases to the heart cycle. There's systole, which is the contraction phase when the blood is ejected out of both the left and the right ventricles. And then the relaxation phase, which is diastole, when both ventricles fill up with blood from the atria. And the sight and sound and position of the murmur will determine whether it's systole or diastole. And the murmurs that we'll look at later, aortic stenosis, tends to occur in systole when the blood's been ejected out of, out of the heart, and mitral regurgitation when you get incompetence of the mitral valve. The diastolic murmurs we tend to look for aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis. And again, I'll cover that in a lot more detail later on in the talk. Auscultation is really the key part in terms of examination wise and certainly we spend a lot of time encouraging our colleagues both in primary and secondary care to be very vigilant for patients who present with symptoms 
which may be related to underlying valvular heart disease. And auscultation is a key part of identifying any murmurs that would warrant further investigation. Certainly that even a faint murmur may, not, may be present even when there's relatively severe valvular disease, particularly in the context of when there's heart failure, so the pumping action of the heart is impaired, so therefore the, the, the um, force with which the blood is ejected out of the ventricles is reduced, resulting in a slightly quieter murmur. So even in instances of severe valvular disease, you can actually have relatively quiet murmurs. So the intensity of the murmur doesn't necessarily always correlate to the severity of the underlying valvular heart disease. But the key step and one that we're highlighting to, to colleagues, both medical and nursing colleagues, is to make sure that we listen to the heart. And if you're presenting with symptoms which may be related to bowel heart disease, do make sure that the physician or the nurse does have a good listen to your heart. I'll just give you an example now of sort of what we listening for when we're listening for murmurs. The first one is just a normal heart sound. So you get the first and the second heart sound called sort of love and the dub. The first heart sound is the closure of the mitral and the tricuspid valves. And the second heart sound is the closure of the aortic and pulmonary valves. So this is what we should expect in a normal heart. And in aortic stenosis, we have a much harsher heart sound. And in mitral regurgitation, pulmonary stenosis. And lastly, in tricuspid regurgitation. I think you can appreciate the different nature and character and sort of intensity of the heart sounds depending on the origin of, of the murmur but the key feature is, is one of auscultation to make sure that we're comfortable um, as, as med doctors and nurses to be to listening to heart to detect these murmurs. What I'll do now is just go through the different valvular lesions looking first at mitral valve and mitral regurgitation. So the mitral valve sits between the left ventricle and the left atrium. So the blood flows into the left atrium, then into the left ventricle, and then out through the aortic valve. So you can get disease in the mitral valve, which causes incompetence. So the leaflets of the valve don't come together. And this can be due to a number of factors, such as degeneration of the valve, rheumatic heart disease, endocarditis or infection, or leaflet prolapse. You can get problems with the cordy, which are the apparatus below the valve. So again, these can be fused, they can be torn due to trauma, or again, due to infection such as endocarditis. You can get dilation of the annulus of the valve. So that can happen if you get dilation of the left ventricle or the left atrium. And again, you can get other diseases and coronary artery disease, which again can cause problems with the muscles down at the base of the leaflet. So all of these can cause incompetence of the valve and regurgitation. And this is what we typically see on the echocardiogram. So again, you've got widening of the mitral valve annulus, 
got slightly reduced motion of the mitral valve leaflets. And as you can appreciate, this is the ray, this is the um, mitral regurgitation flowing back into the left atrium. And this is the left ventricle, which is mildly dilated with mildly impaired overall function. Again, that's an important consideration when you're looking at the symptoms that the patient may present with, and also a marker for potential benefits of intervention. So just reminding ourselves what a mitral regurgitant murmur sounds like. So it's a slightly softer, what we call sort of pan systolic murmur. So it's throughout sort of systole and again tends to be best heard in this space, which is the fifth in left intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. So what are the symptoms that patients may present with who've got mitral regurgitation? Most commonly it's sort of shortness of breath, either with activity, occasionally it can be at night or particularly when lying flat. As a result, patients may have reduced exercise tolerance, fatigue, lassitude. They may well also develop palpitations because of the hemodynamics and the increased pressure within the left atrium, you tend to get dilatation of the left atrium, which provides the substrate for atrial arrhythmias, and the commonest of those are atrial fibrillation. You may get hemoptysis due to increased pressure within the lungs and the pulmonary vasculature, which is, and that may lead to sort of cough or indeed coughing up blood. If the patient is in atrial fibrillation, then there is an increased risk of developing clots. And the, the worst outcome of those clots is a stroke. So again, that might be a complication that patients present with on a background of mitral regurgitation with the um, left atrial remodeling that's happened as a consequence. So the role of investigations and the first line investigations in vast majority of cases of patients presenting with murmurs and symptoms will be to arrange an echocardiogram, which is essentially an ultrasound scan of the heart, which gives us very good views of the valves and particularly assessing the hemodynamic effects and consequences of any valvular lesions and also looking at both the left and the right sided heart function. So in the context of mitral regurgitation, echo can be very helpful at looking at the valve function, so seeing what's the cause or the etiology of the regurgitation, whether it's related to leaflet dysfunction or whether there's issues in terms of mitral valve prolapse, or very, very occasionally can be due to infection on the valve leaflet, such as infective endocarditis. Echocardiography is also very helpful at assessing the severity of the mitral regurgitation. So looking at and seeing if there's any left atrial dilatation or remodeling. And very, very importantly, also looking at the left ventricular function. In terms of intervention for mitral regurgitation, ultimately, and in those patients who have severe symptoms, surgery is going to be the definitive treatment for the regurgitation. This can either be done by repair or replacement. An optimal timing of intervention is really determined by a number of factors, most important of which in many respects is the presence or absence of symptoms. The functional state of the left ventricle in terms of whether there's any signs of any impairment of the contractile function or any signs of dilatation in the left ventricle. Again, those are very, very important markers, both from a symptomatic point of view and also prognostically. In patients who are showing signs of strain in the left ventricle certainly would be good candidates for intervention, for surgical intervention. Other factors to consider are always look, also looking at the feasibility of whether valve repair rather than replacement is an option. Another comorbidity, such as whether the patient's got atrial fibrillation, already got signs of elevated right-sided pressures and increasing pressures within the lungs and the pulmonary vasculature is also an important consideration. 
and in many respects most importantly is the patient's preference and expectations in terms of undergoing what is obviously relatively in certain situations relatively high risk sort of procedures. So mitral regurgitation, the guideline recommendations in terms of interventions, certainly any patient who is symptomatic related, has symptoms related to their mitral regurgitation should be considered for intervention. And certainly patients who are asymptomatic but have signs of LV impairment in terms of impaired function or dilatation or have any signs of increasing pulmonary or lung hypertension or who have valves that are amenable to, to repair. Generally, the choice in terms of managing the mitral valve from a surgical point of view is either replacement, relative, that is a much higher risk procedure with a mortality of up to 7%. Patients invariably require anticoagulation following the procedure, and a lot of the valve replacements will be metallic valves, which commits the patient to lifelong anticoagulation. Valve repair, by and large, is less invasive. Mortality rates are much lower, approximately half that of valve replacement. Patients don't require anticoagulation unless they've got coexistent atrial fibrillation. And generally, valve repair is feasible in about 70 to 90% of patients and by and large is the preferred strategy in those patients in whom it's deemed suitable. Coming on to the other aspect of mitral valve disease, so mitral stenosis, so remember from one of the earlier slides, there's two functional issues when a valve can go wrong, so it can either have um, incompetence or stenosis. Mitral stenosis is effectively sort of thickening with scarring and fusion of the valve leaflets, so there's reduced leaflet excursion. Almost exclusively, this is related to rheumatic fever, and the vast, vast majority, almost 100% of, of mitral stenotic um, valves, when they're looked at histologically and under the microscope, do show some form of rheumatic damage. It's very rarely congenital. And the pure or predominant mitral stenosis occurs in approximately 40% of all patients with rheumatic heart disease. So again, this will be relevant to certain populations and also certain age groups and demographics. I mean, in the UK, obviously we don't see mitral uh, rheumatic fever um, as, as, it, as much as we used to do, but still a lot of our elderly patients are presenting with, with mitral st stenosis, which is rheumatic in, in origin. Symptoms of mitral stenosis, again, not dissimilar to mitral regurgitation, so reduced exercise tolerance, breathlessness, fatigue, palpitations, again, for the same mechanism, the increased pressure within the left atrium and you get dilatation of the left atrium predisposes to atrial tachyarrhythmias, and again, atrial fibrillation is the commonest of those. So complications can include atrial fibrillation, systemic embolism or clots can develop, you can get pulmonary infection due to increased pressure within the pulmonary vasculature and coughing up of blood. And certainly these can be exacerbated by other conditions such as anemia or fever um, or thyrotoxicosis or overactive thyroid. The natural history of mitral stenosis, generally speaking, it's a progressive lifelong disease although it's usually very slow and stable in the early years with progressive acceleration in the latter years. Rough estimate is probably 20 to 40 year latency from rheumatic fever to the onset of symptoms, an additional 10 years before disabling symptoms may, may present. In terms of therapy for mitral stenosis, medical therapy certainly plays a role to a certain extent. Individuals can be very congested in terms of fluid overload, so diuretics or water tablets can be very, very helpful in terms of alleviating and offloading the heart. Beta blockers can be very helpful in patients with atrial fibrillation in terms of controlling the heart rate. Patients who are intolerant of beta blockers, then rate-limiting calcium channel blockers, again, can be a suitable alternative. 
anticoagulation is very, very important in um, mitral stenosis in the context of atrial fibrillation due to the very, very high increased risk of stroke, approximately 16-fold increased risk of stroke. So anticoagulation is very, very important, as is prophylaxis against endocarditis. Again, these individuals certainly are more susceptible to getting infections around the, the um, nose, thickened valve leaflets due to the turbulence around the valve. Balloon valvuloplasty is a potential intervention where they just simply put a balloon inside the middle of the valve and dilate it. That can give some sort of palliative, sort of short-term symptomatic relief. Definitive treatment for mitral stenosis for those patients with symptoms and severe mitral stenosis ultimately is surgical. That can either be by mitral commissurotomy, which is just removing part of the leaflet that might be affected, or more commonly mitral valve replacement, which again can be either with a mechanical or bioprosthetic um, valve. So I finish now with the mitral valve lesion. So now I'm going to spend the rest of the talk just looking at the aortic valve. And first of all, I'll look at aortic regurgitation where you get relatively good mobility of the aortic valve, but you get lack of coaptation of the leaflets. So when the, during the start of um, diastole, the leaflets don't come together. And what you get then is blood flowing back into the, the left ventricle during diastole. Again, number of causes for aortic regurgitation can be congenital. So some individuals are born with just two leaflets. Normally there's three leaflets in the aortic valve. Some individuals may just have two leaflets with a bicuspid valve. And the functioning and the, uh, the morphology of the valve means there's more trauma, there's more stresses across the valve, and they certainly are much more prone to getting incompetence and regurgitation. Aortopathy, such as Marfan syndrome, or acquired, again, rheumatic heart disease or connective disc tissue disorders, or even hypertension, you can get quite significant dilatation of the proximal aorta as it comes out of the heart. And that dilation of the aorta dilates the um, annulus of the aorta valve, which predisposes to, to regurgitation. So this is what you see on, on the echo and just looking at the images. So this is just a normal heart function and you've got the closed aortic valve at the end of systole, just at the start of diastole when the heart's relaxing. What you see in aortic regurgitation is incompetence of this valve. So you've got an open mitral valve as the left ventricle starts to fill in the, during diastole when the heart's relaxing. And instead of this valve being closed, you then get blood flowing back from the aorta into the left ventricle. So you get a significant overload of the left ventricle during diastole. And this is what you're seeing here in this, in this image. So you're getting the valves opening very, very nicely coming out into the aorta, but then a significant amount of blood is flowing back into the left ventricle during diastole. Symptoms in terms of aorta regurgitation, as with the mitral valve leaflets we discussed, mitral valve um, conditions we discussed, Earlier breathlessness can be a feature, particularly with activity, and also posturals often lying flat or at night. Chest pain can be an issue, certainly it can predispose to developing angina. The vast majority of coronary blood supply tends to happen during diastole. And with the aortic regurgitation, you get a reduced pressure within the proximal aorta during diastole, and you then get reduced coronary artery perfusion. And for those patients who are susceptible, that may well unmask or provoke angina type symptoms. So in terms of the natural history of aortic regurgitation, if they've got good um, left ventricular function, so pumping action of the heart, then actually the complication rate is relatively low in terms of the yearly rate. However, if the patient starts to develop um, impairment of the left ventricle, and then there's a much, much higher rate of progression to symptoms in terms of the breathlessness and the lassitude and the reduced exercise tolerance. And as soon as a patient is symptomatic, we know that their long-term prognosis is poor with a mortality of about 10% per year. So the, the, the real focus of management is to make sure that 
intervention, i.e. surgery, is before the patient has any signs of LV impairment, either in terms of function or dilatation, and certainly before they start to develop any symptoms. So the last part of the talk, for the last sort of 10 minutes or so, I'll focus on aortic stenosis. In many respects, this is probably the most relevant and in some ways probably the most severe sort of valvular disease of, of them all and also going to be increasing prevalence. I'll just remind you in terms of what the murmur sounds like for, for aortic stenosis and it's best heard in the sort of second right intercostal space. So it's quite a harsh, what we call crescendo, decrescendo, systolic murmur. And again, relatively easily heard, but again, the key really is, is auscultation. So we need to make sure that we're listening to the, the hearts regularly to pick up these murmurs, because you can often pick them up even before the patient has any symptoms. And that's very, very important as I'll come on to later. Symptoms can be a really, really important prognostic marker um, in aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis is an insidious disease, certainly life-threatening when patients start to develop symptoms in the context of severe aortic stenosis. We're certainly seeing a lot more of it now, primarily due to the demographic changes and an aging population. The vast majority of aortic stenosis is, relate, is related to age-related aortic valve calcification. The characteristics, again, a little bit like mitral stenosis, it's a long latency period when the individual may be relatively asymptomatic. Rapid progression, however, once symptoms start to appear and very, very high mortality in patients who have severe aortic stenosis and develop symptoms. And again, I'll just highlight that in, in a couple of slides. So this is what you see in an aortic stenosis. So the normal valve opens well. Mild aortic stenosis, you tend to get a bit of moderate, you get calcification around the aortic valve annulus with thickening of the aortic valve sort of leaflets. And in severe aortic stenosis, you get marked thickening of the leaflets with severe calcification around the base of the annulus and the base of the leaflets. And as you can appreciate, with significant reduction in the orifice area of the valve. So I'm sure you'll appreciate the cardiac output is, is, is significantly reduced in, in this sort of setting. Factors increasing the risk of developing aortic stenosis. Advancing age, I mean, we're all getting there and we're all living longer and hopefully living better quality of lives. But there's no doubt that the greatest risk factor for any valvular disease, but particularly aortic stenosis, is advancing age. Other risk factors will potentiate and accelerate that process. So a background of high blood pressure or hypertension, diabetes, smoking, all of these will, will um uh, speed up the process and increase the risk of developing aortic stenosis. Other comorbidities such as chronic kidney disease and coronary artery disease again are associated with um, aortic valve disease and aortic stenosis in particular. Symptoms in terms of what patients might present with, so these are sort of things that we'll be looking out for in, in sort of clinical practice both in primary and sort of secondary care. Certainly patients presenting with chest pain or tightness, which may be typical for sort of angina. Reduced physical activity is important, so reduced exercise tolerance, either because the individual is trying to live within their symptoms and doesn't want to provoke their symptoms, so are making a conscious choice to limit their um, activities or their activities are being limited by their symptoms. Again, palpitations can be a feature. Certainly feeling faint on exertion, um, again, is, is, is a potential red flag from, from our point of view. Fatigue and reduced exercise tolerance and again, breathlessness are, are important symptoms to be looking out for. The onset of symptoms really does have a significant impact when you're looking at what we call prognosis and, and survival. 
So as I mentioned earlier, there's a relatively asymptomatic sort of latent period, which may go on for many years, 10, 20 years sometimes. But as soon as the patient develops symptoms, we know that that has a huge bearing in terms of their short and medium term prognosis and outlook. And the symptoms that we're looking for in patients with aortic stenosis are either new onset or worsening angina, syncope, which is sudden unexplained loss of consciousness, which again relates to the dizziness and the reduced cardiac output. As, as you appreciate, the cardiac output is significantly impaired and sometimes there just isn't enough circulation there to support the systemic circulation. And certainly patients with heart failure, so who are developing weakness of impairment of the heart function, have a very poor prognosis and um, you know, within probably two years for the average survival. So all of these are akin to some of the worst cancers that we're, we're trying to manage and treat. And indeed, a lot of the cancer survivals have actually improved over the years, but in aortic stenosis and severe aortic stenosis with any of these symptoms, the average survival is really, really quite significantly um, less. So it's very, very important we do pick up on this this early. Approximately 50% of untreated patients with severe aortic stenosis will die within two years of experiencing symptoms. So this is a very, very serious condition that we need to be managing very, very carefully. And this is what we see when we're looking at the echo. So you'll see a thickened stenotic um, calcified aortic valve with reduced leaflet excursion. Often you'll see a lot of thickening of the heart muscle as the heart has to work harder, as with any muscle in the body, if it's having to work much harder um, against higher resistance, it'll thicken in what we call hypertrophy. So you'll see this thickening of the heart muscle and an increased gradient across the sort of narrowed valve. So what happens now? So patients who have severe aortic stenosis, who have symptoms, we certainly would like to see them assessed within the setting of a heart team and most hospitals now certainly all the tertiary centers in the UK and a lot of the secondary care centers will have a heart team made up of a cardiologist an interventional cardiologist also cardiothoracic surgeon some of the imaging consultants because a lot of these patients need imaging prior to procedures so the heart team will then um, have a discussion about what's the best management option for that patient They'll obviously refer to sort of um, contemporary guidance to help them and they'll do this in partnership with the patient in terms of trying to devise the best treatment strategy for that individual. We know aortic valve replacement is extremely effective intervention in patients with aortic stenosis. There's a 40% survival rate in patients who have valve replacement compared to those who are just managed medically. So again, we know that survival is, is um, severely impaired in those with severe aortic stenosis who don't have any surgical intervention. So surgery does work and it's extremely effective. I think we're probably all familiar now with sort of conventional called surgical aortic valve replacement. It's been around for many, many years and a lot of procedures are still done internationally. And it's again, extremely effective um, intervention, both for patient survival, quality of life and, and prognosis. However, approximately it's still a high risk procedure. Approximately one in five patients are deemed probably too high risk to undergo conventional surgery due to the risks of anaesthetic, the risks of during post-operative recovery and bypass and obviously infection. So there are a significant number of patients, particularly those with comorbidities and frail, frailty, who are deemed to be too high risk um, for surgery. And this is where we come on to the sort of more novel approaches to managing aortic stenosis, which is transcatheter aortic valve implantation. TAVI is most commonly performed via femoral access. As with a traditional sort of angiogram, the actual catheter can be introduced through the femoral artery. And the valve is actually carried on the catheter and then deployed 
over where the native aortic valve is. So you've got the aortic startic valve and you've got the valve, the um, TAVI valve on the catheter, so deployed. And then there's a balloon that dilates the um, valve within the native valve. So you don't actually remove the original valve, that's still there. The new valve simply just compresses it to the side of the aortic annulus. And then the actual catheter is obviously removed and you're left there with the new TAVI valve. So this is a not so new procedure, it's been out for about 10 or 12 years now. It has proven to be extremely effective in managing originally relatively high risk patients, but nowadays is being performed on much more intermediate risk patients who would be candidates for um, conventional surgery. But as you can see, this is far less invasive. It's done through a catheter technique in the same way that you do a, a standard angiogram, except obviously the catheter is a little bit sort of wider bore in order to, to carry the actual valve with, with them. So the comorbidities that might have precluded patients to having conventional open um, valve replacement, such as AL, the elderly, frailty, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, previous surgery or chest um, radiotherapy, again, can make it a very, very difficult environment for the surgeon to work with if they're going to be doing conventional open surgery. So all of these factors certainly wouldn't preclude a patient from potentially having a sort of TAVI or a trans um, catheter procedure. So it really has opened up the way that we can manage these patients who previously wouldn't have been um, offered any intervention or sort of surgery. We're seeing a lot more TAVI procedures being performed across Europe. Um, and certainly initially it was for those at the highest sort of surgical risk. The TAVI is now a recommended option in patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, just at increased surgical risk. And I suspect we're going to be seeing increasing numbers of procedures performed over the coming years. TAVI offers many patients benefits to patients with aortic stenosis, improves short and long-term relief of symptoms, as well as improving quality of life and life expectancy. Principal benefits of this less invasive procedure is a much shorter procedure, as I'm sure you'll appreciate. Certainly less pain and discomfort and a much shorter length of stay in hospital. In our local centre in Southampton, patients are often discharged after two to three days compared to the sort of 10 to 14 days that they might be in after having a conventional aortic valve replacement. The latest guidelines we've got, and these are the ESC, the European guidelines, certainly suggests that TAVI is recommended in patients who are considered not suitable for surgical or conventional aortic valve replacement as assessed by the heart team. And they've certainly now expanded the indications for transcatheter valves because there's now new evidence that even the intermediate risk population do benefit from these less invasive procedures and the durability and longevity of the valves now that we're getting data from 10, 12 years is exceptionally good. So these valves are, are surviving as long as the valves that would have been put in by a sort of standard conventional techniques, which is very, very encouraging indeed. So just to sort of summarise in terms of what we've covered this evening, the key thing, and certainly when we're talking to sort of colleagues and said both in primary and secondary care, is to make absolute sure that we've been very vigilant for patients who may have underlying valvular heart disease. And the first step there is to listen. We must auscultate regularly. And if you do have symptoms that you're worried might be related to heart valve disease, and do encourage your physician or the nurse or the nurse practitioner that you're seeing to have a listen to your heart. Suspect, we should certainly be suspecting valvular disease. And again, any murmur, I think, warrants further investigation. And the investigation of choice would be echocardiography in the first setting. Patients may need further imaging or uh, investigations in terms of assessing the valve in more detail, but echo by and large is the, the, the first um, modality that we, we turn to.
and then refer all patients with significant valvular disease disease should be referred on for further assessment with the local cardiologist or the heart team if they're going to be considered for intervention. So just in summary, heart valve disease is certainly increasing in prevalence as they're driven primarily by increasing sort of changes in demographics with an aging population. Symptoms associated with reduced quality of life and life expectancy. Auscultation is absolutely essential and we really need to be thinking heart valve disease. Echocardiography is important for assessing murmurs. Refer patients for assessment either in the local cardiology unit or to the heart team. And interventions including novel, less invasive procedures such as TAVI, are very effective, particularly at improving symptoms, quality of life and prognosis. So thanks very much for your attention. And in summary, certainly if any patients want to find out more information or individual, or if you've got family members who need more advice or support around um, any issues relating to heart valve disease, then again, there are a number of um, charities um, that are able to provide that and the heart valve voice are certainly a very, very useful and important resource. So please do access their, their support. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Chris. Um, and um, Will was listening in, uh, CEO of, of our voice and um, he was interested, <laughs> he was uh, hoping that colleagues members of the public will be able to follow the terminology. And thank you for going through and explaining that um, with a sort of appropriate language. So just for anybody who isn't clear, auscultation is listening to the heart and um, an echocardiogram is an, like an ultrasound scan of the heart. Yeah. Um, those are the sort of two things that just sprang to mind. Uh, yeah, Chris, are you, are you happy just to say something um, uh, generally, before we get into questions, mm, yeah, um, um, let's see. Um, could you just say something again about the the sort of prevalence of heart valve disease? Just an overview of the prevalence, the typical mm -hmm. symptoms that members of public, you know, non clinical members of the public, ought to be thinking about, and um, the importance about early detection could you mm. be okay just to yeah to sure i mean prevalence is very much driven by sort of risk factors so in certain cohorts so patients with diabetes or hypertension or you know previous or coronary artery disease may have higher prevalence of valve disease in general and obviously aortic stenosis in particular but I think as a rough rule of thumb, and again, age is probably the greatest single risk factor. So I think in, in, over sort of 70, 75, probably the prevalence, the incidence of, of valve disease is probably one in seven or one in eight. Not all of those will obviously be severe or necessarily ever require any intervention, but they will have some form of, of valvular heart disease mm. and they may well be suitable for a sort of routine surveillance and sort of follow-up program to see whether there's any progression in their, their disease or importantly their symptoms. So a lot of these patients will be incorporated into a valve clinic or be followed up in, in primary care with routine echocardiograms or heart ultrasound. So I think it's very, very important that individuals with valve disease are picked up, even if it may not necessarily have any bearing in terms of management in the short to medium term, just so that an appropriate surveillance mm. program can be set up. But when those red flags start to appear in terms of symptoms or there's a change in their valve morphology or severity, then absolutely they certainly need to be then linked in with their local cardiologist and ideally the sort of heart team to, mm. to make joint decisions with the individual. What's the best management going forward? Because we do have these windows of opportunities mm. and 
the most stark of those is, is an aortic stenosis and it's sort of highlighted once symptoms develop yes. then the prognosis is poor and we, you know we're very very good at managing oncology and cancer and we've got good pathways to doing that and in many in many respects this should be managed with that sort of same intensity and, yes. and um yeah and the and the the symptoms the the key thing is although the symptoms mm. that you've mentioned they're they're not specific to heart valve disease they no. lot, there are many things that can cause the and the key mm -hmm. symptoms are mm. getting out of breath when people mm. exercise mm. chest pain and mm. tiredness would you say those are the key absolutely yeah and no, you're absolutely right simon a lot of these symptoms a lot of people will experience at some point and obviously only a relatively small proportion of that will be related to valvular heart mm. disease but unless we go through the appropriate steps in, in terms of taking a, a good clinical history looking at the risk profile of the patient mm. and the risk factors and importantly the examination we yep. won't detect those ones who do need to follow a different pathway but no you're absolutely right i mean breathlessness lassitude reduced stamina are, are common symptoms and yeah. we will obviously need to find out what what's yes. driving those yes. and, and, and if they're not cardiac then there may be other causes which obviously need investigating but those yeah. would be the key ones to look out for yeah. Yeah. and syncope sort of blackouts particularly with exertion in yes. the context of aortic stenosis is very very important fantastic so uh, I mean, part of the this week with uh, European Heart Valve Disease Awareness Week, mm -hmm. it's raising mm -hmm. awareness not just with doctors and nurses and clinicians, but also with members of the public. Absolutely. Just Absolutely. because mm -hmm. something as simple as putting a stethoscope on a chest mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. could save a life. That's, yeah. that's sort of... Uh, putting it as absolutely and, very and i suspect if i if i'm looking into the sort of crystal ball there will be devices that that come online sort of in the not too distant future which which do a lot of this okay you know, in terms of automatic so i think that there will be other other solutions going forward but absolutely i think it's yeah. very, very important that someone has a good listen to the chest yeah that's i mean that was a question that was i was going to ask a little bit later about devices but could I, yeah, if yeah, we could yeah. go through a couple uh, we've got a handful of, of course, questions yeah. here mm -hmm. so um thank you very much firstly to colleagues uh, members of the public who've submitted questions so christine um says and i'll read this out because it's quite a, a sobering uh, tale mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i think um, we would value your thoughts on this um so christine says my mother had the aortic valve replaced in 2008 mm -hmm. and was really well after back to doing her garden and going on holidays etc but uh, three years later in 2011 my mother was taken into hospital very poorly and was in for about 11 weeks before it was realized that the infection she was suffering was actually uh, the valve she'd had replaced was infected mm -hmm. and now the, they were told uh, she needed another replacement and sadly after that surgery she was too weak to recover from the second valve um, op and uh, ended up on, on sort of life support and uh, a very difficult decision later on that um, uh, the benefits mm. of staying on the life support were, were were not outweighed by the disadvantages. So a very difficult scenario mm. um, for Christine's family and her mum. And uh, Christine asks, I'd like to know how common is it to get an infection after valve surgery? And also, how long might it take? Is this a typical thing of sort of taking quite a few weeks to, to pin down a diagnosis? Uh, Christine says at the time we were too upset to ask those type of questions. Mm. No, no, absolutely. No, no, I can understand how, how traumatic it was. And, and I mean, certainly it's unusual for it to take that long. I mean, the symptoms, certainly in the initial phase of, of sort of infective endocarditis, can again be relatively non specific. It's sort of fever, sweats, lassitude. So, again, I think it's having that index of suspicion, and, and she's absolutely right. So, I think 11 weeks is, is a long period, and again, without knowing the details, it's difficult to, mm. to comment further. But I think we do know, sort of stepping back, that certainly individuals who've got prosthetic valves, so who've had valve replacements, are at increased risk of infection, um, as are patients who've had previous endocarditis. So, if they've had previous infections that have just been managed medically, 
they have a needed intervention for their valve. Again, there are at increased risk, and the estimates are anything probably between about 0.6 to 1.3 percent per year um, in individuals who've got prosthetic heart valves, which is much higher than your control group or those who haven't had any any intervention so i think that index of suspicion always has to be there if you're mm. seeing patients you know both in primary care and or even in secondary care and, and i can recall a patient a few years ago exactly that same story but presenting you know really quite non-specific symptoms and again just lassitude fever you know pyrexia sort of really no obvious source and i think that's where you have to just be concerned there is something else going on and ultimately they, they do need investigation in the hospital setting because they'll need sort of quite detailed blood tests done, blood cultures and echocardiography to look at the valve. Sometimes they do transesophageal echo which is gives you even more information about the valve leaflets to see make sure there's no vegetations around the valve. Um, <clears throat> so I agree I mean I think yes there's no doubt at all they are a higher risk group. So I think you know, we just need to be very, very vigilant. And uh, Christine, Will from Heart Valve Voice has put a, a reply to your Facebook um, uh, comment on the question tab there. And um, Will Wone, who's the CEO of Heart Valve Voice, and he'd he'd like to have the chance to to hear your story. Um, you know, the the Heart Valve Voice charity is very much there to hear from patients with all the whole spectrum of experiences whether it's been a positive one or a less than positive experience so uh, i would encourage you to get in touch with will his email address is on that uh, reply that he's he shared there um okay uh, moving on thank you for that response um chris so brian is asking can stress cause heart valve problems uh, again, a very good question. Uh, the, the only challenge with with stress, as, as in, in really sort of any any sort of setting, is is sort of quantification of it. Because what's stressful for one may not be for another. So just from a pragmatic sort of clinical point of view, it's one of those things that's quite difficult to to test in in what, what, what we consider sort of gold standard trial setting, which is a sort of randomised control trial. So. I think there's no doubt at all anecdote you know anecdotally stress plays a huge part in in a whole range of illnesses so it's impossible to say it doesn't have an effect in this setting it's just mm. a question of trying to understand how much and sort of quantifying that mm. and that's always going to be a, a challenge so so you'll get a lot of empathy and sympathy but in terms of showing you the evidence and, and the data and the papers there aren't any unfortunately but that you know that shouldn't sort of negate the the impact and again stress also might have a bearing in terms of other sort of lifestyle and maybe ad adverse lifestyle factors that you know people might adopt in stressful situations such as smoking not exercising not taking their blood pressure medication so there's other issues around a sort of stressful setting which probably also do increase the risk not only of aortic valve or valvular disease but other cardiac complications so mm. I, I agree i mean i think certainly probably does have a role it's just a question of they identifying it recognizing it and then then you know offering appropriate interventions mm. to help manage it great uh, thank you for that chris um question with two parts from helen um mm -hmm. first part is uh, how can I strengthen my heart valve naturally? So you, uh, so, and the second part is, is heart valve disease hereditary? Um, certain forms of heart valve disease are hereditary and certainly we see a number of sort of congenital anomalies with valvulopathies or valve problems inherent with them. I mean the commonest one that we probably see is, is bicuspid aortic valve which can some estimates say can be anything sort of one to two percent of, of the population and the the stress and the trauma and the sort of um, the hemodynamics around the bicuspid aortic valve do make them more prone to getting aortic stenosis slightly earlier maybe in their sort of 50s or 60s than the sort of general population and as we discussed earlier it makes them a little bit more prone to to sort of incompetence and regurgitation of the aortic valve so that would probably be the main one although there are a number of other um, valvular lesions which tend to be more sort of congenital 
Um, and the other question was about how we can sort of look after our heart valves. And I think a lot of that's around just managing sort of lifestyle factors. There's only no evidence of any particular nutritional or sort of other benefit that makes a difference either way. I think the key things are making sure your blood pressure is well controlled. So checking that from time to time. And again, the best way of managing high blood pressure or abnormal blood pressure in many instances is around lifestyle in terms of keeping active, exercising regularly, um, obviously avoiding smoking, excess sort of alcohol. So I think a lot of those are sort of cardio protective as well as just protective from a sort of heart valve point of view. So anything you're going to do to help your general cardiovascular risk is going to have a, a benefit as well from a sort of valve point of view. So I'd see them as, as one and the same in, in that respect. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, um, are we okay to do a couple more? Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great stuff. So, um, um, are we, um, uh, Sally says, my mother had a heart valve replacement in her late 60s mm -hmm. and in her late 70s, so about 10 years later, she was diagnosed with dementia. Is there any link between the two? Uh, no, not not that I, I know of. No, not not a causal link. I mean, some of the risk factors which might predispose to developing dementia, such as sort of cerebrovascular disease. So you can get like a sort of multi-infarct type picture when it comes to dementia. So there's different, again, as, as I'm sure you're, you're aware, the different forms of dementia. So someone who's got valve disease may have underlying sort of vascular disease as a sort of comorbidity so in that sense there might be a link but not not directly from from the valves themselves to to sort of cognitive impairment okay fantastic a question relating to the prevalence of valve disease these days you mentioned the biggest risk factor is age increasing age mm. um, and then other risk factors that, that can be linked to other forms of heart disease mm -hmm. so like high blood pressure mm -hmm. in terms of valve disease when i was in medical school um everybody was talking about rheumatic uh, mm -hmm. heart disease and some patients mm -hmm. may have heard that term um one part part of the question is could you explain uh in a way that the public might understand about what is rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease and then if rheumatic heart if rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease is on the big decline, mm -hmm. um, yet we're seeing an increased incidence of heart valve disease mm. um, because of the aging population. So yeah. is there a, it's sort of a little counterintuitive. <clears throat> One might sure, expect sure. heart valve disease to be going down if rheumatic fever is going down. So could, could you untangle that as well as just explain what rheumatic fever is and rheumatic yeah, heart disease? Yeah. I mean, rheumatic fever used to be sort of prevalent and endemic, certainly across Europe and in the UK, probably up until the sort of 30s, 40s. And then due to a variety of sort of public health measures, we've seen a reduction in, in the rate of rheumatic fever, which, which is an infection. So it's a sort of bacterial infection. And for some reason, it has a propensity to set up this chronic inflammatory response, response which primarily again targets the sort of atrio, um, the mitral and the tricuspid valve so patients who often get sort of thickening and um, of the mitral valve with reduced sort of leaflet excursion and mitral stenosis and the good proportion will get a similar sort of issue on the right side of the heart in the tricuspid valve why it's just rheumatic fever that predisposes that i don't think anyone sort of knows but certainly it is well well recognized and i think fortunately because we don't have as much rheumatic fever in the endemic population we don't see it in the sort of younger cohort but there certainly will still be patients in their 70s and 80s and, and, and 90s obviously who would have had rheumatic fever when they were in their sort of young childhood and early sort of teenage years when it tends to be more more prevalent and certainly again often we, we see it in patients in certain parts of the world particularly in sort of sub-saharan africa or in the subcontinent is still relatively prevalent so again there's probably much much higher incidence of, of rheumatic fever and rheumatic fever related valve disease in those sort of populations so it's certainly something that we still need to be vigilant and, and um and, and look out for uh, i mean 
in terms of we see a lot of mitral valve calcification and sort of thickening which is more degenerative and age related which tends just to affect the the base of the mitral valve and often doesn't actually involve the leaflets as such so we are seeing much much less sort of mitral stenosis in the uk but i i'm certainly aware that it is it is relatively common elsewhere okay fantastic and then just the last question i think is to do with uh, the future and the obviously the the big push to mm. to get hearts listened to and then mm. that relying on a certain level of skill with a clinician listening to the chest and so the question about um was put about modern technology and uh you know we're, we're aware that there are now automatic blood pressure machines that will measure your blood pressure without a clinician being involved could there be a, an automatic type stethoscope that could be used for screening by people with a, a lower level of me, uh, medical training to sort of increase the reach of opportunistic or organized screening programs? Mm. Yeah, so I, mean, I think it's only a question of time, really. And I'm sort of aware that there are a number of sort of centers, particularly in Cambridge and sort of elsewhere, that are looking at developing the technology. Part of it's related to AI, part of it's just related to the building up the database, really. And the key thing is to develop devices that are sensitive enough to, to make sure that we're, you know, picking up sort of murmurs and have. The sort of intelligence as it were to sort of discriminate between what are normal heart sounds and what are sort of pathological heart sounds that need further investigation. I think it's only a question of time until those become available and are licensed and obviously given the appropriate um, authority you know to, to go ahead and, and market them. I think in many respects it probably will make things easier we know that the stethoscope again even you know in good hands isn't necessarily as sensitive or specific as we would we would all like in terms of clarifying identifying um, murmurs and even in those who, who maybe don't do auscultation quite as often that sensitivity and specificity is even even less so i think anything that improves on that will be a benefit the key thing really will with these is detecting those patients who need further investigation yes. um, and obviously that's sort of like a cardiography but i yes. think there's still a, a huge role for clinical judgment in terms of symptoms and then devising a sort of management plan so these will just be tools to accessing the appropriate investigations. But about, I think it's only a question of time that they, they, will, they will be on the market at some point. Great stuff. And um, as we, let me just check uh, on the Facebook page, I think, I, yeah, I think we're, we're all good in terms of uh, questions. So um, thank you so much for, taking us through that presentation Chris and thank you for uh, dealing with the questions if there are, there are about to be people listening to this either live or watching the recording who'd like more information mm -hmm. is uh, heartvalvevoice.com which is obviously there on the screen it would are there good resources for members of the public to access on that website? absolutely yes yeah or the um you know, British Heart Foundation, again, <clears throat> another sort of excellent resource. So, and I'm sure sort of internationally, they're probably, and I know Heart Valve Voice have a presence both in Europe and, and in the States. So, mm -hmm. so there may well be something that's more tailored to your sort of local area or sort of region that, that mm -hmm. provides local, more local advice. But absolutely, I mean, that they're, they're a very, very good resource indeed, um, mm -hmm. as are the British Heart Foundation. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Chris Arden for presenting and giving up some of your valuable time talking to uh, members of the public and uh, making use of this form of modern technology. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's thank come you. Across okay. and hope yeah, it's useful. yeah so. definitely. And thank you to everybody who has been attending, uh, uh, whether you're, you've been uh, watching live or whether you've been watching the recording. Thank you for your time. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions earlier uh, really helpful to have those questions uh, a big thanks to heart valve voice the charity that have made this session possible and the other activities through this week and have a little look at the heart valve voice facebook page or the heart valve voice uh, uh, website because uh, there are other activities and it's not too late to get involved in some of those if you'd like to especially there's a children's storybook event happening on friday and the mile walk event
uh, you might uh, see posts about those. Um, thank you to Will Wohn, Chief Exec of Heart Valve Voice for helping to coordinate things. And uh, a big thank you to uh, Silver Surfers for uh, mm -hmm. making uh, this opportunity available. Um, thank you for commenting, sharing, showing your <laughs> emotions, uh, uh, lots of interaction on the Facebook page. So I think uh, definitely a very successful event and uh, thoroughly enjoyable, but more importantly, very valuable information. So um, reflect on what you've heard, have a look at heartvalvevoice.com, uh, all the British Heart Foundation websites. Uh, if you're in doubt, um, go and uh, let somebody at the surgery, a clinician, whether it's a nurse or a doctor, have a listen to your heart, um, especially if you've been getting more out of breath when you exert yourself, especially if younger members of your family have commented on that, or if you're having a chest pain that's new or different, um, if you've become more tired to the extent that family members have noticed it or friends have been teasing you about how tired you are. Although there are lots of other causes uh, than heart valve disease relating to these symptoms, uh, it's a very simple thing for a doctor or a nurse practitioner to have a listen to your heart and either put your mind at rest or be able to look into things a little bit more for you. Mm. Um, any final thoughts, Chris, as we come to the end? No, thanks very much, Simon. No, that's very good, Simon. Thank, thanks ever so much for everyone for hosting and for, for all of you for joining, even more importantly. So thanks ever so much. And like I say, if you've got any, any questions, do do sort of um, look at the Heart Valve Voice or, or the British Heart Foundation. Well, thanks ever so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wish everybody a very good rest of your day. Uh, thank you, everybody, again. And uh, bye for now. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Thanks very much, Simon. Okay. okay. I'll, uh, I'll I'll say you. Are you happy? Off. Are you happy without a debrief? Are you you probably? Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. Well yeah, done. that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Thanks very much. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Bye bye.